relay and inducing a transcriptional output. And so there's a lot of things going on, even at this like cartoon level. So to really kind of dive into what happens in the signal transduction event, we have to think first about the structure of the protein. So um, looking at this in a more um, modular, a modular way, we can start at the bottom with this catalytic domain that's highly conserved across all kinases. And upstream of that are sensor and linker domains that you can think of as Legos. And as long as these domains are coupled in the right combination, you should be able to get a, a functional signal transduction event. And what's key to having signal transduction in this system is that regardless of the domains that are coupled together, there's a conserved coiled coil core at the uh, center of these signal transduction receptors. And so coiled coils are assemblies of alpha helices with idealized ones shown on the left. And on the right are the longest structures we have to date of, of any transmembrane histidine kinases. So they're still truncated, but it does give us some insight into the fact that regardless of what the actual domains look like, at the core of them is this alpha helical assembly. And what's really a point of contention in the histidine kinase field right now is exactly what happens during signal transduction. And so the way that people are typically thinking about this is with very specific and minute structural rearrangements that happen down that coiled coil core as a signal is passed. And so I've highlighted here all of the possible rearrangements that can happen in a coiled coil, as well as the combinations of different rearrangements that have been identified in a signal transduction uh, receptor through structural biology efforts. But what I really want you to take away from this is that if we're only thinking about structure, then really the mechanisms by which a, a signal can be passed are just as diverse as the histidine kinases themselves. And so it's really hard to come up with one conclusive answer about like what is signal transduction in this system. And so the work that I'm pursuing in the DeGrotto lab uh, aims to address this question of whether we can establish a more generalizable model or hypothesis about signal transduction in this pathway. And I hope that I can convince you that I think that maybe we can. Um, but in, for, in order to do this, we really have to consider thermodynamics and energetics, not structure. And so um, this is where there won't be any math. <laughs> um, but I want to kind of walk you through what we think about this hypothesis and how we reached there. Um, so when the kinases were first discovered, they were proposed to have a static on-off model, where the receptor existed in its off state until a ligand bound, and then the full receptor activated in a rigid body movement. But what we now know is that this is like far oversimplified. And in, instead, the working hypothesis is that it's a stepwise mechanism. So from the off state, a ligand can bind and activate the first domain. And it's the activation of that first domain that turns on the second domain. But in reality, proteins are much more complex than this. And they each exist in their own uh, equilibrium between conformational states. So if we want to more accurately think about how to go from this off state to the on state, we actually have to consider a number of different states in combination. So this is the extent of the math. There's no more. <laughs> um, but what happens during a signal transduction event is that we're biasing the equilibrium towards this lower right corner. And so we have to really understand the inter interaction and connection between all of these combinations of states to understand how that on happens. But I've only shown this as two domains. And work in my lab has shown that histine kinases likely act as three or more coupled domains. And so this equilibrium becomes exponentially more complicated as you add in additional layers. And so we're posed with a really complicated question of how can we study thermodynamics in the system, in the context of the whole system, in a very targeted way. Um, so that's where I'm really lucky to come in on this project because we're uniquely poised to combine tools from protein design and from protein engineering to control specific properties of the subdomains as well as the connections between the domains so we can start to directly test this hypothesis about signal, uh, thermodynamic coupling and signal transduction. OK, so um, the inspiration for this project comes from some work in the synthetic biology field where people have been using modular domain swapping to rewire these kinases. So essentially, you can take the sensor domain from one kinase and lob it onto the scaffold of a different kinase, and you can elicit a, the same biological output from a different input. And so we want to do this, but take it one step further. And instead of using natural protein domains, we want to use de novo proteins that we've built from scratch with very specific properties so that we can control what we're putting into the system. We always turn to nature when we do protein design for inspiration. And we know that in natural histidine kinases, there's a helix at the center of these sensor domains that's essential for signal transduction. And so what we really wanted to do was to come up with a de novo protein that mimics this, this periplasmic helix but has very specific and tunable properties. And so we proposed a model 
of a minimal de novo sensor domain. And the only requirements is that it has to mimic that uh, P helix and it has to bind a ligand in some sort of equilibrium. So we can imagine something that goes from a, a relaxed state to a tense state in a ligand dependent manner. And there's a million different ways we could get to this answer. Um, but because we had no idea if this project was gonna work at the outset, we started with a de novo protein that was previously designed in the lab for a different purpose. Um, so this is the protein here. It's a new to nature protein that binds zinc. And we liked zinc as a starting point because zinc has a really, like the chelating event for zinc binding has a really high thermodynamic input. So we know at a minimum, we're gonna put enough energy into the system to turn on signal transduction if everything else works. And so I made some small modifications um, to it to make it more amenable to put onto a histidine kinase scaffold. And what I wanted to do was to go from a native kinase like this to a designed chimera. But you have to be really thoughtful and careful about how you engineer this in order to get a signal transduction event. And so thinking about this histidine kinase um, mechanism and structure, there's a couple of different things you can think about, some of which I mentioned, like the responsiveness of the sensor domain, maintaining the continuity of that periplasmic helix. Um, but the one that I hypothesized would be most important is the site and phase of, phase of linking the sensor domain onto the scaffold. And that's because if we go back to the original model, it's the properties of the domains themselves and the connections between the domains that matter the most. And so I wanted to start to come up with an unbiased way to screen the effect of fusion on the kinase activity. And so I started by um, picking a kinase of interest. We have no full length structures, so I had to build a homology model of the protein um, to get some sort of idea of where we could best start to truncate it and generate a fusion. So I basically can lob off the sensor domain, but vary the, the residues that I retain in the natural protein on all of these transmembrane helices, but I've shown two here for an example. And then I want to kind of Frankenstein a chimera uh, to look something like this, where the only thing that's varied is this region here. So the de novo sensor domain is there and held constant in all of these experiments. And so I um, cloned a small library of, of mutants where the only thing that varies is the point of fusion into the scaffold. And I devised a cell-based assay where you can directly measure transcript or signal transduction as a transcriptional readout. And all of this is done in E. coli. So I can clone in a single step, transform in a single step, and screen the library by flow cytometry or fax. And the expected result is that if the kinases are actually active, we'll have zinc-dependent M-cherry expression. And so in order to parse through this library in an unbiased way, um, I set up a sequential sorting experiment where I can first propagate the cells in the presence of high zinc, take the highest M-cherry population, which should be the most active kinases in their most active state, and then propagate that in the absence of zinc. And what we expect to see is a left shift in the population if those kinases are truly zinc dependent and are turning off M cherry expression. And excitingly, we had no idea if this was gonna work, um, but it, it ended up working and that's what we observed. Um, so these are the dot plots from the flow cytometry experiments in the absence of zinc and the presence of zinc with M cherry on the X axis. And we see a right shift in the population in the presence of zinc, indicating that there are some members of this library that are responsive to zinc um, and can transduce signals faithfully in the presence of it. So then we sorted those populations, propagated them in the absence of zinc, and we observed a left shift, repropagated them in the presence of zinc, and we see that population go back towards the right. And so this is our first ever indication that we can use a de novo protein to turn on signal transduction pathways. But it gets even cooler if we start to look at individual isolates where we see that di different isolates from the same library have different basal and zinc responsive profiles. But it's this uh, dose response data that I'm really excited about because we can see that two isolates from the same library have hugely different M cherry expression levels in the same zinc titration. And if we sequence those, we can see that the linkage between the um, new sensor domain and the transmembrane helices only varies by like a couple of amino acids on either side. And so it's super small changes in the geometry of that sensor domain onto the rest of the scaffold that give us really big biological uh, differences in output. And if we come back to the original model where we hypothesize that the main thing um, that varies in the system is the, the connection between those two domains when domain one gets activated and passes it to the second, um, we can actually mathematically model this relationship. And we've shown that um, the main difference in activation is a function of that coupling between those domains. And so we have experimental data for the first time that supports this mathematical model that we generated in the lab. And so it's a really exciting result that gives us um, proof of concept that this hypothesis is actually valid. 
And so I hope um, that I've convinced you that protein design can be a really interesting tool to deconvolute complex biological mechanisms and can give us um, a platform by which we can parse out mechanistic insight into complex thermodynamic, or thermodynamic uh, phenomena. Um, okay, and so I wanted to take my last couple minutes to give a little bit of retrospective about myself and how I ended up working on this project. Um, so all of my training, formal training, has been in chemistry, but it's all been applied to biological systems, um, broadly under the umbrella of exploring uh, molecular mechanisms of biomolecular communication. And so I started with computational and bioorganic chemistry research in undergrad and moved into chemical biology research in grad school where I was mostly looking at signaling pathways and proteostasis networks and neurodegeneration. And it was really at the end of grad school where I realized like, I maybe am not motivated by the neurodegeneration question itself, but by these fascinating enzymes that make these complex biology, um, biological mechanisms possible. And so I decided I wanted to transition to thinking more about these enzymes themselves, how we understand them, how we can engineer them, and what we can do with that. And that's how I ended up working on this project in the DeGrotto lab. Um, but most importantly, I think that this trajectory not only has shaped me as a scientist, but has been really influential in how I think about teaching and training future scientists. Um, and I think I was really fortunate at Rhodes to have what I feel was like the absolute best possible research, first research experience with like super supportive, engaged mentors who helped me build autonomy and independence and like really championed me along the way. And because of them, I have been really intentional about pursuing training in both teaching and mentoring and applying that training um, in as many, probably too many <laughs> um, opportunities as possible. Um, but those are the kind of things that really motivate me and make the science more exciting is that I have a lot of opportunities to work with new scientists and help them see like how cool these systems and these questions can be. And so um, I hope to continue to work towards applying the training I've gained in intentional mentorship and inclusive pedagogy um, to improve persistence and retention in STEM in my own career one day, um, which I hope will sit at the interface of protein design and natural protein biochemistry. So I have a lot of projects that I'm excited about in this area, some of which are looking at mechanisms that help different proteins with the same overall scaffold have very different specificities in the same biological system, some of which apply protein design to rewire the flux through different signaling pathways or to change the specificity of signaling enzymes so we can parse out what parts of proteins lead to different specificities and different biological outcomes. And I also think that protein design um, as a tool can be hugely important in biochemistry education, because especially with all the new tools that are coming out um, and really open access interfaces, we can use protein design to help students understand from first principles how sequence and structure relate to biological function. And so um, that's where I see myself going. Hopefully I can get there. Um, but I wanted to just end by thanking everyone for their attention and for the opportunity to be here and to thank all of the people and funding and fellowships that have made my uh, scientific trajectory possible. <laughs> On time. <laughs> Beautiful work. I, I loved it. That's so cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, does the audience have any questions to Katie? Oh, I can throw the thing. <laughs> Let's see. I can aim. If not, you are very unlucky today. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Maeve from Michigan State. So, uh, super interesting. Thank um, you. I was wondering, so because the single transduction is, you know, right, there's the histidine kinase and then the subsequent response regulators yes. that come through it. And there's always this sort of interesting data with some response regulators on sort of the state that they're in and how phosphorylation changes that. Mm -hmm. Have you ever looked at like these thermodynamic sort of shifts like this in those to see like what, like the states that result in them being active versus non-active and how phosphorylation affects that end of the signal transduction pathway? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, so we have not worked on it yet. For most of the bacterial histidine kinase pathways, the cognate response regulator is a monomer that becomes a dimer upon phosphorylation. And that's a pretty widely accepted paradigm. There's a few exceptions. Um, the long-term vision for this project, which will far outlast me in this lab, hopefully, is to like work our way down the whole kinase scaffold and replace every domain and combination with the DeNovo mimics. And so that would be kind of the last step if we can get all the way down and then also make de novo response regulators, then we can really show that we understand the mechanisms of this pathway. Okay. 
<laughs> I'm right here. Don't throw it. <laughs> that was really great. Um, Thank you. If I understood from your from your slides correctly, you had in, like indels that distinguished your two isolates that were responsive to zinc differently. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Do you do you expect you'll find point mutations that are capable of also tuning it, or is that like too, not enough of a leap? Yeah. So that's what I'm working on right now. Um, so basically, for the ones that are functional, let's see if I can go back to it. Maybe. <laughs> um, well, so for the ones that are functional, it's, they only vary by a couple amino acids. And so what we're doing next is doing a saturation mutagenesis at that linker to see how sequence of the linker affects the outcome. And our hypothesis is that things that are more stable in helices should make that connection more stable and maybe tune it down a little bit. And things that destabilize it a little bit will push it on further because you're getting a bigger change in response to the ligand binding. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I guess I have a related question, which is, do you see any, um, like the changes you're seeing in the linker, do you see that ever in natural variants of these? And does that tell you something about differences in responsiveness across yeah. the family? Yeah, we haven't looked at it exhaustively, um, but it would be a really interesting bioinformatics question to do. Um, often, so we, <laughs> we have a paper from the lab that's like mathematically modeling the effect of insertions or deletions into that idealized helix assembly. And basically, the more you disrupt the idealized helix, the more it's going to turn on because it wants to be in that ideal conformation. And if you make it like frustrated or uncomfortable in that, <laughs> in that sort of arrangement, it's going to be more likely to turn on. Um, so it's something that I think is a really interesting evolutionary question that nature has like used these small insertions to tune the responsiveness of different pathways where they need different magnitudes of responses. Yes, proteins can be frustrated. I totally yeah. get it. Other questions? I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Are these histidine kinases used for drug discovery as well? Yeah, um, there's a little bit of work looking at them for antimicrobial drug discovery. Um, I have not worked on it. We've done it a little bit in the past in the lab, but there's a few of the kinases. So they're, they're really cool because they can respond to like ions, they can respond to pH change, they can respond to osmotic stress, um, but they'll also, there's some that are responsive to antimicrobial peptides. And so then we can take what we understand about the specificity of the peptides, re-engineer that to make a new version. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, is there any, no more, not anymore. No more <laughs> questions. Thank you, Katie, yeah, for this thank wonderful you. Talk. Thank you.